welcome to the CEDH Criteria Rollout Redux, sponsored by the Association of Schools and Programs of Public Health Accreditation and Credentialing Committee. My name is Liz Weiss, Director of Education for ASCPH, and we're very pleased to have you here today. This program is geared towards ASCPH members, our deans, faculty, staff, student, and graduates of schools, whereas others are welcome to join in the conversation. We have a number of handouts that are relevant to the conversation today, and you'll see them here on the screen as well as listed in the right-hand side in the portal for the webinar. These handouts are also available on the CEPH website at the link that you see there at the bottom of the screen. We're very pleased to take your questions at any time during the webinar. In fact, we have see received a few questions already as you registered, and they're on the docket for answering first. So go ahead and submit questions uh, now or as they come up during the webinar. We're going to have all the lines muted so that we can hear the presenters clearly. So the way for you to communicate with us if you have any issues during uh, if you can't hear or have a question or something else, just put it right into the chat box that you see there listed with the arrow. I'm going to introduce our speakers on today's webinar first, and then I'll be inviting them to, to uh, say their opening remarks. Our webinar moderator for today is Dean David Goff. He's Dean of the Colorado School of Public Health at the University of Colorado, Colorado State U, University of Northern Colorado, and he's here as the chair of our credentialing, our accreditation and credentialing committee. So thank you, Dean Goff. I'd also like to recognize the ASPPH member counselors, of which we have three official counselors, Dean Donna Peterson, Dean John Finnegan, Dean Iman Hakim, and also we include Ms. Ruth Gare Bernheim as one of our friendly counselors as she represents one of our member programs. We're very pleased to have with us today in person in our offices representatives from the Council on Education for Public Health, Ms. Laura Racer King, the Executive Director, and Ms. Molly Morvanity, the Deputy Director. So David, I'm going to turn over the mic to you to talk about our work in accreditation. Uh, thank you, Liz. I appreciate that. Uh, I want to welcome everybody here today uh, to this webinar. As you know, um, next slide, please. I don't think I can advance these. Um, as you know, we've gone through a, a wonderful process of working on the new accreditation criteria. Um, the ASPPH uh, staff supported a large number of committees and working groups that reviewed multiple versions and drafts of the accreditation criteria. Uh, we had hundreds of, of uh, comments that were distilled into feedback to see through those rounds. And um, I think it's fair to say that CEF has been very responsive to the input from our association, uh, making changes where they were in the best interest of education in public health, and explaining to us the rationale for other uh, criteria uh, that perhaps didn't get changed uh, quite as much as um, some of our members might have liked to see. But I think the entire process was a really wonderful uh, experience in which our members were highly engaged and CEF was very responsive. And it couldn't have happened without strong staff support from ASPPH and Liz in particular. Next slide, please. So today the um, objectives are to really identify and discuss salient features of the new accreditation criteria, and there are now the final accreditation criteria to describe a uh, sample institution's approach to implementing the new criteria over the near term, the next several years, and to locate training and technical assistance opportunities in uh, the remainder of this year and next year so that our member uh, universities and programs uh, can learn more about the accreditation criteria and how to come into alignment 
with the new criteria. Next slide. Um, next up, we'll hear uh, comments from Dean Donna Peterson, as you heard earlier. She's a, um, a counselor to SEEF. Uh, she's also Senior Associate Vice President of University of South Florida Health and Dean of the School of Public Health at the University of South Florida uh, and President of SEEF. So, uh, Donna, please. Thank you, David. Thank you, Liz. And uh, thanks to everyone who's on the call today. On behalf of the Chief Council, I really want to thank everyone not only for this program today, but for the incredibly positive partnership that we enjoyed with ASDPH over the entire criteria revision process. As Dean Goff said, this really wouldn't have happened without the full engagement of, of all of our uh, partners, our uh, accredited schools and programs, and people in, in, in the larger public health community who all participated in the discussions that, uh, that informed these criteria and, and sent thoughtful comments and really helped us shape what I think is a wonderful platform for the future. And so, as we've said, we are now uh, at the point where these criteria have been adopted. We're, we're rolling them out, and um, this is a wonderful opportunity for you to learn a little bit more about that process. And we will continue to provide these kind of opportunities, both through ASPPH and through SAFE in the, in the weeks and months to come. So just a great uh, amount of appreciation on behalf of the Council for everyone who participated in this, and, and a lot of encouragement for those of you who are now going to embark on the changes that we hope will help create a very robust public health education system in this country to uh, enable us all to do the best job we can do improving and protecting the public's health. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. We are going to move on to the meaty portion of the webinar. And Molly Mulvanity is going to take this part from CPH. Molly? Great. So what we're going to focus on today, the learning objectives were pretty clear for our uh, agenda today, but we're going to uh, talk a little bit about the substance of the criteria and then really take a step back and talk about the implementation, since I know that folks are really eager to uh, think about how the rubber actually hits the road. So. The biggest changes that you will notice to the criteria, I'm going to go through them very quickly, um, starting at the right-hand side, data and documentation. All of you have probably heard us talking about how one of our major priorities in this process was to reduce the data reporting burden and to really think very critically about every single element we ask you to provide in a self-study document and to really try and make those um, meaningful. Uh, to try and really measure what matters and to try and uh, reduce the amount of reporting that feels um, futile or extraneous, et cetera. Um, next component, the organization of the criteria. They look different. Um, they start with numbers rather, uh, rather than, I'm sorry, they start with letters rather than numbers. There are a lot more of them. The fact that there are a lot more of them, however, really goes along with that data documentation, reducing the reporting burden. What we've done is sort of sliced them up into um, really key small pieces that are easier to analyze, easier to understand, and we hope easier for both schools and programs and site visitors to work with. Finally, the reason that most of you are probably on the phone today is because we made big changes to the curricular criteria. So this is the first time we've ever defined in a specific way the curriculum and expectations for a DRPH degree. Um, and we made really fundamental changes in the way we are expecting documentation to appear and the competencies and uh, knowledge that we're associating with MPH and bachelor's degrees in public health. We also made changes um, in, in a more minor way to the other degrees that appear in many schools and programs, such as MS and PhD degrees, um, even other professional degrees that are in some of our schools and colleges. We, um, rather than making a sort of a fundamental approach to the way we look at those, we really took those and made them much more specific. I think we had uh, realized that there was maybe a little bit of lack of clarity around what our expectations were, so we tried to make that very clear. All right. 
Diving into the details, most of you know this by now, but the magic date to keep in mind is December 31st, 2018. That's the date by which we expect to see compliance with the new criteria. And we've defined two courses, course one and course two, um, that will define how each applicant and accredited school and program will be dealing with uh, demonstrating that they have implemented the new criteria. So. Um, Again, most of you are probably familiar with this, but I want to emphasize it, and I'm going to emphasize it probably again and again. If you stay tuned for just a couple of weeks, by December 1st, you will have a letter arriving in your inbox, deans and program directors. Please be on the lookout for it because it's really important and it's really personalized. Each of these letters will explain exactly what your institution needs to do to demonstrate compliance. Okay, so. A basic overview of how we're going to approach the next two years. The first thing, here it comes again. On December 1st, you are getting a personalized letter. We want you to take your time and really read and digest them. Uh, some of your letters are a little bit less than a page, some are three pages plus. So um, we uh, know there's a lot of information in there and a lot of details, so please don't panic if something seems crazy. Please try to digest the information in the letter and then make a plan. Uh, we are happy to work with you, CEPH staff, once you've read and digested that letter. If you are still feeling panicked, pick up the phone. Do not sit and panic in uh, solitude. Okay. So the important thing to know, and this is something that I think we just all have to sort of uh, get used to on the CEPH staff, is that there are going to be different plans for different settings. And I've got a bunch of people in the picture here, but it's not nearly enough people to represent how many different variations we're going to see on needs and issues and uh, different ways of coming into compliance. We expect that there are going to be approximately 10 trillion, that's just an approximation, uh, different small issues and uh, variations that arise as we go through the next couple years of, implement of implementation. So we are committed um, to working with you to work through all of the issues and sometimes we're going to have to answer questions on an individual basis based on very specific individual circumstances. Okay, so in the next couple of slides that we're going to talk through, the important thing to know is when your next accreditation term ends. And so probably most of you have that date uh, memorized. You could recite it if you were tortured. But um, if you are not sure when your next accreditation term ends and you have another window or your iPhone handy, you can go to our website. And the screenshot there shows you under the About tab. There is a, a link that says Accredited Schools and Programs List. You, so you just pull that down and click on that. And you get a page that looks like this. Scroll down and find the entry for your school or program if you're already accredited. And you'll see at the bottom of each entry under the name of the school or program, there are two dates. The first date in parens is the original date of accreditation. And the second date is the date of the expiration of your next accreditation term. So if folks are looking at that on your other screen right now, commit your expiration date to memory. All right. If your expiration date is one of these four dates, if it's one of these four, you are going to do your next self-study and site visit using the 2016 criteria, and that's it. That's the compliance plan for you guys. So this is a really narrow window, only four uh, possible expiration dates. So if you're in one of those four expiration date categories, you can tune out for the next couple of slides and just bear in mind that you're doing a full self-study and site visit using the criteria and that's how you're coming into compliance. Everybody else who is not in one of those four expiration date categories, pay attention to what's coming next. Okay. What I've, uh, what I've got up here is the important thing for you to sear in your memory, everybody else who wasn't in one of those four categories. You need to take your calendar for January 2018th and mark the date. All of you are submitting a report to CEPH on January 9th, 2018. It's a Tuesday. You can plan for it. Um, everybody is going to sub be submitting a report to us on this date unless you are in one of those four categories I mentioned previously. All right, so what are you going to be submitting on January, in January 2018? What I have up here is some sample text from a, one of those letters that you're all going to be receiving on December 1st, okay? 
So here's the first part of the letter. Like I said, they, they are fairly lengthy. So I've, I've excerpted parts, but I want to show you what it's going to look like. All right. The first paragraph is pretty introductory information explaining what the letter is all about. In the second paragraph, we reaffirm what your accreditation term is. We are checking, double checking, and triple checking these. But if somehow you get a letter and it doesn't match up with what you think or what you have found or what you expected, pick up the phone immediately. We will fix it. I hope that won't happen, but uh, please let us know. But we're verifying your accreditation term expiration because, again, that's really crucial to what's going to happen next. Okay. So the first thing we say in there is, hey, everybody, you've got to continue completing annual reporting every year on your regular schedule, even in the years when you do a self-study and site visit, you're doing annual reporting every year, period. Starting with the report that you submit in December 2018, we are going to change the format in which we ask for information on faculty resources. So the information in the annual report starting in December 2018 is going to assume a format that allows us to validate compliance with the expectations as they're defined in the 2016 criteria. Okay. Now we're moving on to the next part of the letter. If you are in one of the groups and receive a letter that looks like that, we're going to tell you that you're going to be submitting something called a compliance report. So a compliance report is just another type of reporting. You know, you do annual reporting. Sometimes you do interim reporting. Sometimes you send us additional information. It is a report that goes uh, first to CEPH staff and then to the CEPH council who makes a decision based on that report. Um, so your January 8th or January 9th, 2018 date, you're going to choose one of two options, option A and option B. And what you see down below, the first thing that we explain is what option A would entail. So you can see uh, that there's a long list of information there. Now, when you get your letter, it's going to be tailored for you. So I've shown a list there that is for um, that has a lot of requests. But guess what? If you only have an MPH, if you're a program on the line and you only have an MPH in the unit of accreditation, that's what your letter's going to look like. A lot less reporting. Because we're being really specific to each institution on trying to let you know uh, what you need to report on. Again, we're triple checking these. But if something doesn't make sense to you or doesn't jive with what you think you should be reporting on, pick up the phone. All right. That's option A. Option B. Option B is probably the uh, less uh, documentation, it's definitely the less documentation, documentation intensive uh, reporting request. It's two things. Option B asks you to give us a template from the new criteria, and it also asks you to give us a plan. So instead of giving us a lot of different templates, a lot of different syllabi, you're giving us two things, basically the template and a plan. And the plan is your plan for how you are going to demonstrate compliance by that magical date of December 31st of 2018. Here's what a sample plan looks like. It's got to be extremely specific. All of the actions you would need to take, who the responsible parties are, this really shows us that you've thought through what the different steps are that you're going to need to take in compliance. You can see we ask you for a start date, an expected completion date, and then the, follow, the final column asks whether you've completed the tasks or not. Remember, you're giving us this report in January of 2018. You know about it today. Well, you know about it as of December 1st, officially. But um, we expect that you'll be well into completing this plan by the time we get the report on in January of 2018. So we'll expect to see progress in that column, and we'll expect to see a reasonably laid out plan for how you're going to achieve the parts that you haven't yet achieved. If we see no's in that far right-hand column that you haven't completed things that, or that you're not on track, we're going to do a couple of we're going to do one of a couple of things. We may require a mandatory consultation visit. Um, where either you come to us or we go to you and sit down and hash out how we're going to get back on track. Or we may require some additional um, uh, reporting. We may require uh, some mandatory phone calls and counseling. There are a variety of actions that the council may decide to take if they don't think your plan is in the shape it needs to be in. So right now, the choice that most of you have is whether you're going to take option A or option B when we get to January of 2018. Okay, so what my suggestion is, is the first thing that you do is identify your limiting factors. 
And what I mean by limiting factors are the things that are going to be the most challenging or take the most time for you to do to achieve compliance. Limiting factor one could be faculty resources. I think it's highly unlikely. For our program constituents on the call, I think this is especially unlikely, unless you've changed your program significantly and haven't let us know, um, because uh, the requirements are, um, if anything, a little bit more flexible for faculty resources for programs. For schools, it is possible that some of you may take a look at the templates and decide that this is something you need to take a look at, simply because we've changed the way we are asking you to report on and allocate faculty. I think it's unlikely that um, too many institutions are going to have faculty resources as the limiting factor. I expect that the limiting factor for most of you is going to be curriculum. So I would look first at your MPH. We have a lot of very specific requirements around the MPH, and um, that is likely to be an area you may be uh, worried about or tense about or worried about um, how long it's going to take you to come into compliance. Um, the, the next thing I'd look at is the DRPH. As I mentioned, we've given structure to the DRPH where it did not exist before. So I think it's quite likely that that's going to be another area that many of you are going to want to focus your time and energy on as soon as possible. Uh, bachelors, again, fundamental redo to the way we're framing it. I think many of your curricula will probably be um, likely the BS, uh, the, the bachelors in public health criteria are very flexible. So I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised when you start looking at how, to, to looking at seeing how your bachelors in public health lines up, but take a look at that. And then for some of you, you're going to want to look at your MS and PhD, and sometimes those take a while to get changes made in just because of the nature of the degrees and the faculty, and maybe you have extra levels of approval with a graduate school. All right. Find your limiting factor. Pull out the template. If you're worried about faculty, pull it out. Um, sit down. Somebody who knows the faculty really well, whether it's a staff member in academic affairs, whether it's an associate dean, just sketch it out. Don't try to do it perfectly. Sketch it out. Put some names in there. Pull out the template, put some names in, and diagnose how challenging the problem is going to be. Same thing with the template for MPH. Take it out, and again, I'd advise, you don't need to convene a, a full meeting of the curriculum committee and, and every stakeholder who's ever been known. Take a few people who are really familiar with the curriculum and just do a sort of a rough and dirty sketch it out and sort of see in general terms where you think you are on this. Where are the big gaps likely to be? It doesn't have to be perfect, but it's going to help you diagnose what type of work you need to take on and how much time you need to allocate. So the next thing I would say you need to do once you've done your diagnosis is identify key stakeholders on their timeline. So the first one is that many of you have multiple levels of curriculum committees. And if you expect certain types of change, perhaps you expect that you're going to have to create a new class or new classes. Um, in, in your diagnosis, you say, gosh, you know, we're going to have to take something that wasn't formally required and make it a required class now. What levels of curriculum committee does this have to go through? That's going to help you establish your timeline. The registrar. I've already heard this from some folks. Registrars can be tough, uh, tough players. And so uh, start thinking about that now. If you're going to have to update listings of required courses, what, what, how are you going to negotiate that with your registrar's office? Students, alumni, and community advisors, we expect that you'll want to involve them in your process as you do some updates to your curriculum. I think the really good news, though, is that we took a, a three-year process at CEPH and built on so much of the work of Framing the Future and other bodies, so you aren't vetting competencies for the MPH. You aren't vetting competencies for the DRPH. We've got those. <laughs> we've taken a lot of different work, and we've already got those vetted. So when you think about the scope of this work, we certainly want you to involve your stakeholders, but don't be intimidated because we've done a lot of the work for you, we hope. And then obviously, once you've got those folks, mobilize them and get them moving on what they need to be involved in. All right, so the next thing you're going to do, and this is probably happening simultaneously with the previous steps, is you're going to choose an approach. Some of you are going to be able to modify existing classes. You're, in some cases, perhaps you won't even have to change the list of classes that are required for your degrees, but you're going to have to change the syllabi, the readings, the assessments. Some of you may just be making these kinds of modifications, and if you find that at your diagnosis stage, that's where you are. 
some of you are going to need to create new classes. I anticipate that that may be true. It's going to depend um, on where you are now in your curriculum and how your alignment looks when you sketch out that template. I expect that most people are going to be doing some combination of both. All right. So I know that uh, one of the pieces of feedback that um, I know Liz has been really in touch with a lot of our constituents, and we've been in touch with a lot of our constituents, universities and their processes move slowly. And 20, the end of 2018 seems like a long way away uh, to any objective observer, but in university time, that's the blink of an eye. So I know a lot of you have concerns about the timeline. We know this. We hear you. So the first thing I want to say is I need to be clear about why we've chosen this timeline. It's not because we are evil, um, you know, uh, an entity um, uh, bent on achieving destruction among our schools and programs. Um, we believe strongly in using accreditation best practice, and best practice calls for us to ensure compliance with any changes of criteria within as short a time frame as possible. Um, also, we are accountable to the U.S. Department of Education. Now, I want to be clear. The U.S. Department of Education regulations do not mandate a specific time period for accreditors phasing in new criteria, but they are applying increasing levels of scrutiny to accreditors who have institutions that are not in compliance with one or more accreditation criteria. The regulations allow us some latitude and discretion in defining appropriate phase-in periods when we adopt new criteria, but the two-year period we chose was not pulled out of thin air. It aligns with what U.S. Department of Education regulations say about how long we are allowed to maintain accreditation of a school or program that is out of compliance with one or more of our criteria. Given the current heightened attention on accreditors from both Congress and the executive branch, we're really cognizant of the need to ensure timely compliance. We also try to maintain fairness and consistency as key principles. Schools and programs with site visits in 2018 will begin using the new criteria, so it is important that other schools and programs demonstrate compliance in order to maintain fairness and consistency. That's kind of the philosophy. Number two, we are going to abide by this schedule, but it is not the council's intention or interest to immediately revoke accreditation for an institution that runs into some snags and is not able to de demonstrate full compliance. As we do in all of our operations, we will work with institutions, we will use tools such as interim reporting and other mechanisms to ensure compliance for those who um, are, are, are feeling particularly challenged or who have an unanticipated event. Number three. I'm going to encourage you, the council and the staff are going to encourage schools and programs to be creative and motivated and in investigating ways to, to speed up your university processes. Where there is a will, there is often a way, and your accreditor feels very strongly about your achieving compliance, so we would encourage you to be as creative and persistent as you can in investigating any roadblocks that you see in your way. Finally, I'm going to urge you to dive into looking at the actual data requests in the compliance report. They're very specific. They're not everything under the sun. They're not a full self-study. What do you need to do to achieve compliance? Are there things you can do short of reimagining every aspect of your curriculum, which we would be happy to have you do, um, but are there things you can do and prioritize to achieve compliance and to make the deadline that we've set? So we've got a lot of opportunities, as, uh, as, as you've heard. Um, for training and additional uh, assistance with interpreting and implementing the new criteria. We hope we're going to speak to all of you very soon. Um, I, I keep plugging the ability to individually email or call any of our CEPH staff members, but we're also going to be out in the country and on our phone and computer lines um, working with groups of you in groups uh, in places where you are likely to gather. So this is all on the CEPH website. Um, if you click on the 2016 criteria link that's on our main page, it takes you to a lot of resources, including a calendar like this. You can see we've got a webinar coming up on December 2nd. We're going to be pushing information out about that very soon so that you know the details, how to register, et cetera. Um, I also want to put a plug in for our Twitter. We're at CEPH Tweets, all one word. And because we're going to be pushing a lot of information out over the coming year, um, we're not going to email you every time we, we make something available, but we will tweet about it. And so if you want to follow us on Twitter, that is a great way to sort of um, keep up to date on what we have available on our website and what kind of sessions we have training up uh, coming up. 
Molly, thank you so much. That was an excellent overview and uh, really distilled uh, guidelines on how a school or program can can begin tackling this uh, this change. So thank you both so much for coming in and for your very proactive communications. And that list, if you wouldn't mind going back, Sarah, is just one example of all your engagement and reaching out to all of us. So thank you, thank you. So the question uh, lines are open. I wanted to mention also that this webinar will be archived uh, pretty shortly after it wraps up. You will all get a link. And we will disseminate that link widely for your peers and others who want to tap into the rich information here. When you registered, we received a few questions already. So we're going to give first priority to these questions. And as well, questions from our own members will receive priority. We have about 170 individuals on this webinar. And I'm sure some of you are in rooms with more people. So we'll do our best in the last. We have a lot of time, half an hour. Uh, to try to cover all your questions. So the first one here, how are schools planning to evaluate employer satisfaction and the follow-up from that same individual, is there an evaluation template? All right. These, uh, these questions are both related to, um, to uh, a similar area in the criteria, but they're actually separate. So um, one of the things that we do require currently and we continue to require in the future is that schools and programs evaluate um, employers' perspectives on how students are prepared at all levels. So if you have bachelor's, master's, and doctoral, we want to know at all levels how your students are prepared for whatever it is that they're going into next. We usually say employer satisfaction as shorthand, but if you are looking at a student population, let's say you have a bachelor's degree and most students are trying to go on to uh, graduate or professional school, we want to know how that's going too. So you're evaluating basically, are students able to achieve their intended outcomes after they graduate from the degree program? What we've seen over a period of years is a pattern. Um, and that is that pattern has has become really clear um, as I've as I've worked with dozens of schools and programs on this issue. Um, and that is that no single approach standing on its own is truly effective and meaningful. What we uh, what we uh, find to be successful is a mixed methods approach. Surveys alone are not turning out particularly well for most folks. Um, Response rates are low. That's true on surveys in general, and 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 people get kind of wonky about you know, am I evaluating a particular individual or am I just speaking about graduates in general? We, we try to we try to emphasize that, that the reason for collecting employer satisfaction data is not to judge the performance of individual students, but to get folks to speak broadly about um, the types of graduates your institution is is producing. So. Some limitations to surveys, but there are also some strengths to surveys um, that I think you all are probably aware with what those are, just sort of from your own knowledge in the field. Um, focus groups and key informant interviews are turning out to be the, um, the glue that holds together meaningful data in this particular arena. So they can be used in conjunction with surveys, they can be used in conjunction with each other. Um, we are less concerned with the particular methodology than with the outcome, which is intended to be useful data. What we want to see if you're doing key informant interviews and focus groups is that you've taken the data, the qualitative data, and you've analyzed it and distilled it like you would any qualitative data, and then you've sat down with it and grappled with it um, and tried to think about how you can use it to inform your curriculum and uh, your preparation of students. So mixed methods is the bottom line answer. Is there an evaluation template? Well, there are a number of templates related to evaluation. We no longer have the template that is drilled into all of your brains. We call it the outcome measures template, where it said measure, uh, target, one, two, three. That's gone. Um, but there is a um, what I would call a bit of an analog. One of our templates uh, in the evaluation section asks you to explain how you measure the goals and object I'm sorry, the goals that you've defined in your evaluation plan. So we've gone a little bit less granular 
in recognition of sort of the evolving thinking, I would say probably in the, in the planning and evaluation world at large, about different methods um, of doing evaluation and planning processes. So you are, the template basically, it is more of a word template than a numbers templates. Um, we, we do have some templates throughout the document. For instance, when we talk about research, we do have something that looks a little bit more like that outcome measures template you're used to currently. But the evaluation template that appears first in the document is one that basically says, what are you trying to do and how are you tracking whether you're doing it? So that might not always be through numbers. We understand that an important way of tracking uh, what you're doing might be something that is more words-based. But just like I mentioned with the employer uh, focus groups, you need to be taking data, sitting down, having an agreed upon set of data, whatever it looks like, and grappling with it as faculty members. Think about whether you're doing the things you've set out to do. So although we've moved to a less structured template, I think we are every bit as rigorous, if not more rigorous, in expecting to see documentation that you've really thought through, hey, we've said that this is what we're doing in our guiding statements. How do we know if we're actually doing that? And there are a lot of different ways to measure it. Hey, Molly, thank you. Our next question that has already come in is, what is covered under the term informatics? So I love this question um, because during the uh, revision process, we had the word informatics in one draft and then not in another, and there was a lot of controversy and a lot of folks who were very vocal advocates for including the word informatics. So we know uh, that there is um, a real desire to ensure that this sort of what some might call, and some might disagree with this characterization, but some might call it a, an emerging field of importance in public health. What we mean by informatics is pretty much um, the translation of raw data into information that is communicated to stakeholders in a way that drives decision making. That's what we mean. And so there are a lot of different specific definitions for informatics, and probably there are some informatics people on the, um, uh, on the line right now, and you're thinking, oh my gosh, she didn't mention a keyword or a key aspect. Mm -hmm. So we invite you to be as specific or not about your own definitions of the word informatics. But as we conceive of informatics, we think it's absolutely crucial to what we're trying to do with um, the training of public health workforce for the future. Thank you. On to the question box. Go ahead, keep submitting questions. I'll start with the first one that's come in. Will present DRP students be allowed to follow the old criteria that were present when they enrolled in their degree program? Yes. All students, um, we expect that all universities will honor the uh, obligations or the catalog of uh, students when they enroll. So obviously this will be a phase in that will be happening over time. Now something I always like to mention, although we expect that universities would honor their obligation to existing students, if students voluntarily wish to switch to a newer curriculum and your university allows that, uh, we would encourage you to, to speak of the benefits of switching to a newer curriculum. Um, this is a curriculum that's been pretty widely vetted and we think reflects where public health is now and in the future. So um, yes, honor your obligations, but if you'd like to offer students the opportunity to switch, I don't um, know of any reason from our perspective that we wouldn't encourage that. Great. I understand that you all took that approach with some of our members who were uh, coming through up for their site visits with baccalaureate programs. Exactly. You supported them in going ahead into uh, adopting and getting reviewed on the That's a great future. example, Liz. That's a great example, yes. We, we had some institutions where they and their students opted in to the new curriculum early. Um, they were excited about it. Their students were excited about it. So we've already had some sort of um, um, experience with this. Great. And we've heard uh, positive reports from that. Great. Next question. We are a public health program with the 2017 site visit based on the 2011 criteria. At the July CPH accreditation workshop, we were told that a compliance report regarding the 2016 criteria would be due in early 2017. It looks like the compliance reporting deadline has been changed to January 2018. 
Do we understand this correctly? You do understand it correctly. And I was the one speaking about the compliance reporting at that workshop that you're referring to. And so I apologize if I misspoke. Definitely 2018 has been the plan all along. And so, gosh, I must have had a senior moment when I was in front of the group at the accreditation workshop. Okay. Thank you. Here's one. Why Twitter and not email? Some people prefer email. Okay, I, I do want to emphasize that we are not giving up on email and we are not requiring you all to tweet, but um, we don't want to email you every day. And so uh, we will continue to email you just like we did when uh, we were when we pushed out each round of criteria. Um, we're going to be emailing everyone to tell you about opportunities to register for webinars, but we will not be emailing you on the daily, letting you know about new additions to the FAQ document. We just think that would probably drive you crazy. Uh, just to let you know, though, actually we are working on an initiative at CEPH right now to set up some different email lists with subscribe and unsubscribe options. We're still working on it, um, but we'd like to set up some options that are a little bit more flexible so that you can get emails from us more regularly if you want to, and just get emails when major things happen if you want to that we're not quite there yet, but we're working on it. And if we post something on Twitter, um, we will absolutely also post that on our um, the web page as well. So please check there. Um, yeah, most of our Twitter stuff is actually linked back to our web page. Right. So it's always there as well. Okay. The next couple questions have to do with D5, which is the MPH Applied Practice Experience. And first question is, what is the recommended number of contact hours for the MPH applied practice experience? Oh, this is a big one. There is no recommended number of contact hours. We are sort of, uh, you know, I sort of, I think I made a joke maybe at one of the recent talks that some of you may have been at, you know, that we're sort of, we're, we're, we're going into new territory. It's kind of, it's, it's a new world. It's kind of scary and exciting at the same time, but we've got we, we've chosen very deliberately after a lot of discussion to walk back from the concept of contact hours and to walk toward the concept of outputs and outcomes. And so we are not going to be able to, you know, I know sometimes folks want to sort of play a guessing game with us, like, okay, what does 150 sound like? Is that good? I'm not going to be able to, to, to work with you on that because um, we're really we're really choosing an approach that looks at outcomes. And so in some settings, that's going to take 75 hours, and in some settings, that's going to take 400 hours. And it's really, we're really putting the onus, again, this is one of those exciting slash scary things, we're putting the onus on each school and program for you to look at your student population and your community needs and to figure out what's needed for your students and your community because it's going to look different for different student populations. It's going to look different in different communities. It will probably look different um, for different individual students as well. Um, and this provides an opportunity to tailor um, to tailor the approach really as much as is needed for that particular student. This is an issue on which ASTPH will be paying close attention in order to assist members with uh, information sharing regarding how you're handling it and as your own best practices emerge that you may wish to share or you need feedback on something maybe that didn't work so well. Uh, look to us and we really would like to hear from you on what would be helpful if you evolve to this new model. So the second question on the same topic is under what conditions can the MPH practice experience be waived? It cannot. Um, and again, that's because we've gone back to, uh, to an outcomes-based model. So each student is producing um, at least two documents as many documents as you choose to uh, choose to uh, require, but at least two documents that demonstrate at least five competencies. So those competencies have to be uh, demonstrated. The products that they are documenting have to arise from a practice situation, not a classroom situation. And so how you ask students to get there is up to you. So the concept of waiver just doesn't even make sense anymore. Everybody is producing that documentation of products achieved from a practice setting. And so there is no waiver. Um, there are different ways to achieve those products. Maybe some students who are very experienced, or perhaps if they're working in an appropriate setting, are achieving those through uh, 
some activities affiliated with their workplace. The products are the important thing. Now, if your school or program wishes to place additional strictures beyond that, um, uh, that is absolutely at your discretion. But um, the concept of waiver just isn't relevant anymore. Thank you. The last question had to do with the MPH. The next one is with the DRPH. Is the field practicum going to be required now for a DRPH student? What if they are already working professionals in public health and meet some of the foundational competencies? Yes, this is very similar to the last question. Um, except with DRPH, um, our approach, we even chose to be a little bit more, if I might say, specific. Um, we do expect that DRPH students are um, doing projects that allow them to apply their doctoral level skills and knowledge in a practice setting. So every DRPH student must be doing practice-based work. However, um, what may be entirely appropriate for a student who's already um, an accomplished professional working in an appropriate field is to take on uh, consulting projects. The student doesn't necessarily need to travel to a different site or sit at a different desk, um, but he or she could accomplish a consulting project of some significant nature uh, for an organization that is uh, that is in need of those services. So um, I think that's a model that a lot of folks are going to use um, because it doesn't require the student to um, you know go and sit in any particular location. It allows the student to apply his or her expertise, and it produces a project that is it is of use to a public health related organization. Great. Next question. Can schools and programs add program wide competencies that reflect the mission of the school and program? Absolutely, and we would happily encourage that. You know, honestly, we, we are at such a stage, we haven't gotten down to the nitty gritty of would we ask you to add it to the template that we've already populated, or would we ask you to add it to your template for uh, concentration specific competencies? We can work with you on that. We'll work that out, I promise. Um, but yes, we would encourage that. Um, if you'd like to add, um, we have a list of 22 foundational competencies that all MPH students must do. If you'd like to make that 25, because you've got three that are very specific to your mission, we would absolutely encourage that. And we'll work out where you actually physically write them in the template later. If the school creates a new MPH concentration to be in compliance, do students need to be enrolled in that new program? Or could we have the program on the books, but no students enrolled? Wondering what is expected for an option A compliance report. Yeah, so if you've got it, this is going to, and this is definitely going to happen. And this is, you know, like I said, one of those probably approximately 1 million or however many I saw it, uh, variations. Okay, so if you've got a program, a uh, new MPH concentration, and you want to demonstrate compliance, but you don't have any students in it yet, or they've just started, so you haven't gone through the whole curriculum, and you're trying to submit an Option A report, what you're going to need to do is submit the documentation in terms of filling out the template and showing us the syllabi. We don't require students to have actually completed the courses, but we will expect to see the documentation um, in the form of a populated template and syllabi. If you are still in the process, if you're sort of mid-process um, and you don't have all the syllabi developed yet when you're submitting option A, again, this is another one of those one million variations. We'll talk to you about it. We may still encourage you to submit an option A report and have the council follow up with you um, in terms of requesting tailored interim reporting to make sure the other gaps are filled in. Um, so we can work with you on those issues on an, on an individual basis, but we are going to be very rigorous about making sure that we have documented coverage through a template um, that shows an assessment activity and a syllabus that documents that, um, that particular experience. Um, other things, as I said, will sort of be a, a matter of timing and we'll work that out with you. Okay. Next question. Will you please discuss the transition from the five core areas of public health? to the new integrated competencies in the new MPH foundational knowledge and competencies. Yeah, so what I would say is if you look at D1 and D2 together, if we're talking MPH, so that's your foundational uh, knowledge in, the, in learning objectives and that's your foundational competencies, the 22 statements, you will see the five core areas there, even if you don't see all of the words there. Um, 
you will also see some other things that maybe you didn't strictly think were part of the five core areas. Um, certainly concepts such as advocacy, um, some issues such as planning that maybe weren't in um, your core course, your five core courses, if that's the way you've been doing it. So you're going to see all the five core areas there, but you're going to see some other things too. Um, is it possible that you can take the five courses that exist, you know, let's call them, you know, health, A, B, C, D, E. Um, is it possible that you could take those and play around with the syllabi and, and take some things out and put some things in? Yeah, I think in some settings that's possible. I would encourage you to um, be as creative as your uh, setting warrants, but do I think there are places that can work with some courses that they already have on the books and, and play around with them and, and, and modify and pull things out? Absolutely. Okay. Next question. How do we know who will be contacted at each MPH school and program? Um, so actually, you know the list I showed you earlier on our website? Um, the individual on that list is the individual that we will be contacting. Um, and because of the volume of institutions that we have to deal with, it's very difficult for us and, you know, I'll, I'll be frank, it's a limitation of our IT system. Um, we, we don't always have the most sophisticated ability to contact multiple individuals. Um, I would say we're going to do our best, but the person who is on that list on our website is definitely going to get an email from us on or before December 1st. And I think Sarah's clicking through to show you the slide where you can See that list on our website, yep, that's what it looks like. Okay, thank you. Next question, will requirements for the MSPH degree program be the same as for MPH degree program? Okay, this is a big, it depends. So I know of at least two accredited programs, um, I'm just thinking off the top of my head, um, where the MSPH is intended to be equivalent to an MPH. It's intended to be an MPH degree, but it's named MSPH because of historical or other kinds of reasons. In those cases, absolutely, you're following D1 and D2, um, and then D3 and D4, etc. cetera. Um, in other institutions, and I can think of at least two schools that I know of, the MSPH is essentially an MS degree. It is an academic degree, and it is named MSPH for historical or other reasons. In those cases, it will not be expected to follow criteria D1 and D2. So in the instructional, uh, we, what's currently called the instructional matrix, but is called temp template intro one, and you'll notice it's in both option A and option B reports, we force you to classify and categorize and be very clear about which degrees are which. And so um, you would, you, um, if you have any questions about how it's operating in your school or program and how we would view it, please contact a member of the staff and we'll work through it with you. But we're going to use that matrix in template intro one as sort of a guide and um, figure out which sets of criteria apply to each degree. Can you go back and clarify what the four program end dates are? If we have one of these dates, and you'll see it back there on the screen, if we have one of these dates for the 2018 process, does it apply or does it not apply yet? So if you, if you have one of the dates that are up on the screen right now, you are going to do your next self-study and site visit using the 2016 criteria you are not going to do any other reporting unless it's the type of reporting that arises from normal interactions that we have with you now, like annual reports, interim reports, issues that came out of a substantive change that you already submitted. But self-study and site visit are going to use the 2016 criteria, no negotiations. Okay, that's nice and clear. <laughs> Question about the tweets. Are they going to be archived on the website? Archived on the our website, no. Archived on Twitter, yes. Great. Next question, we might be able to fit in this one and perhaps one more. Apply systems thinking to a public health issue. Can you elaborate on the tool reference, please? 
Yeah, we've gotten this question um, a number of times, and, and I, I'm not being flip um, at all, but um, if you Google systems thinking tools, you're going to see that there are a lot of them. We chose to use the word systems thinking tools because we do mean um, there is a field of knowledge known as systems thinking, and there are tools and techniques, and there are a lot of them. And um, what we mean is not, um, sometimes when we talk about systems thinking, it gets a little uh, squishy for lack of a better term, and people say, yes, all of our students understand the ecological model, and they understand that the healthcare system and the regulatory system interact, and that is systems thinking, and that's not what we mean. So we chose to use the word systems thinking tools for a reason. This is an area where I know um, it is new, and there has historically been a lot of confusion about systems thinking, so I anticipate we'll be doing technical assistance, either in written forms or some of our upcoming webinars. And those of you um, who are on the webinar, if you are somebody who studies systems thinking and often uses system think systems thinking tools and you would like to get in touch with me or Laura and let us know that you have some information to share, um, we would be happy to get in touch with you and work with you to sort of help you help your colleagues uh, along in this process because it is new to our criteria. Okay, lots more questions in the box. We're going to get at least this, uh, this next one in. How can schools assess performance on interprofessional teams? Well, I think there are a, a multitude of ways, and we've talked about this on other webinars. We've probably talked about this at every step of the criteria revision process. I know it's an area that's creating anxiety, and I'm going to make the same plug I just made for systems thinking. I absolutely anticipate we're going to be doing technical assistance in both written and, and live or webinar format. So if you are somebody who has a really cool interprofessional thing going on at your institution, get in touch with me and um, we will uh, we will possibly draw upon your expertise. Um, we expect that there may be a variety of ways. So um, there may be simulations, there may be um, extra curricular activities or co-curricular activities. They must be mandatory. Um, so you can't have uh, an opportunity that not all students to it attend because then you wouldn't be able to assess uh, how students had performed. But um, I was at a conference recently with uh, other health professions accreditors and uh, all of the other major health professions have requirements around interprofessional education. We were the last actually to adopt it as part of our accreditation criteria so we're a little bit of an outlier. Um, and they described a variety of methods that were both curricular and co-curricular and they described some challenges their own institutions have had. Um, and I do think that it will require um, for some of you who are in health sciences setting it, it, um, what's the word? Um, working with your colleagues to expand the thinking a little bit um, so that, you know, you're not just doing a standard patient. You know, what's the public health student got to add in that situation? Although, I just recently visited a public health program that is in a health sciences setting and did an interprofessional case um, with, with groups of students and did a standard patient kind of approach. And it turned out the public health student was the one who got to the heart of it because uh, she thought to ask about, um, about smoking and about the family situation and things like that. So she kind of beat out her clinical colleagues. However, Long sentence. Um, we also hope that some of you will be thinking outside of the health professions box and getting your, your public health students together with architecture and urban planning or other disciplines that we might not traditionally think of as an interprofessional public health team. That's where we hear the future is going. And so we're going to encourage you to get creative. So um, as I said, more to come from us on that. I know it's an area a lot of you have some concerns about. Molly, I'm really glad you mentioned simulations. ASPPH is working with our medical college and uh, College of Nursing colleagues and APTR to develop an online video uh, learning module on interprofessional collaboration in a foodborne outbreak. Oh, we plan to roll that out by uh, August of next year, and we hope that's going to be useful in particular to fulfill this competency. Thank you so much, Laura and Molly, for your time, for those great questions. We have a lot of questions left in the box. Rest assured that we will be providing those to Molly and Laura, and we will post answers to them um, in a narrative version. Give us a, a week or so to, um, to get that done, and you'll get a shout out via email to make sure that you get to see those. David, it is back to you for wrapping this up. All right. Um, thanks, Liz. I need to get my 
I've been muted, so I need to get my microphone back down. Hopefully everybody can hear me. Uh, I want to thank you all for participating today. It's clear that there are many, many questions, as is appropriate when new accreditation criteria are released. Fortunately, there will be many opportunities to get additional training on this um, as per the schedule that was shared earlier this morning and that will be made available on our website. Um, please move to the next slide. Um, you know, your accreditation and credentialing committee will continue to work with you to um, assist in implementing the criteria and you've heard a lot of interest in supporting that today both from folks at ASPPH and at CEIF. Uh, as always, reach out directly to CEIF with questions to Molly. When you do have questions, please keep us copied at ASPPH so that we can, can uh, you know, assist in the development of a frequently asked questions um, document with responses. Next slide. Um, this is how you will be able to access the webinar recording. Uh, and we'll post this also on our website and this information will be sent out in our usual communications so that people who are not on the call or the webinar today can uh, access it in the future. Next slide. Uh, Liz, I think this is where you or um, someone else in the ASPPH office takes over and I want to thank you for organizing this webinar today. Yeah, thank you, King Golf. This is Sarah. Uh, this is just a list of additional uh, upcoming ASPPH Presents webinars that people may be uh, interested in, in attending. Uh, you can access these on our events page, and uh, you can drill down to webinars to access these alone. And please mark your calendars for the upcoming uh, 2017 ASPPH Annual Meeting and the 2017 Undergraduate Public Health and Global Health Education Summit both taking place in March in Arlington, Virginia. And lastly, Liz? Yes, thank you, Sarah. We would be remiss, this is uh, Dean Goff's second to last day in the office at the Colorado School of Public Health. And we want to thank you, we salute you, Dean Goff. You have been our leader for over the last year of the Accreditation and Credentialing Committee. You have been amazing, you've been on point, you have listened. You have guided us so well. We are going to miss you, but we wish you the very best. You're moving on to NIH, and we're happy. It's, it's pretty close to us here in D.C., and we look forward to working with you in your new capacity. And we also have a little sound for you from all of us. It's applause. Maybe you <laughs> Well, you guys are great. You guys are great, and you're very sweet to do that. Thanks so much. It's it's been a privilege working with you and all our members. And um, I'm, although I'm a bit wistful about leaving our school, I'm excited about uh, moving to NHLBI, uh, where I hope to be able to influence the investment of uh, the strate strategic investment of research dollars into um, activities that will help us improve cardiovascular health at the population level. So um, looking forward to it. I hope you guys will uh, look me up when you come to Bethesda. Thank you, Dean Goff. Many best wishes. The webinar is now adjourned.